So as you heard from Cheryl, uh, we are Bloomworks. I'm joined by Katrina, Hannah, and soon I think Renata also will be spotlighted. And Renata is here representing, um, we're so thrilled to have her. She's representing the client team as well, uh, which you'll hear more about. And we are gonna be talking about a project where we undertook some co-design to co-design a kin-fast culture approach in child welfare. I'm so excited to get into this, but before we do, can you explain what co-design is, Shelley? Yes, of course. So as you might have heard in other sessions, or maybe not, if you're just logging on now, uh, co-design is a co-creation practice, a design process where users can join um, the design team and offer their input as lived experts. Um, it's often called other things too. Uh, sometimes it's called participatory action research or community-based participatory, participatory excuse me, research. So PAR, CVPR, um, but we're finding these days that people are really calling it more and more just co-design, um, which is very clear. Um, and it intends to um, include both uh, kind of data gathering activities like research, interviews, focus groups, things like that. Um, and also more ideation or solutions generating activities um, in like workshops and things like that. So more on that soon. Um, but first, maybe we should define some other key terms in our in our in our speech. Oh, yeah, Shelley, what are we what are we going to be covering today? We already got in a lot in co-design, but what else are we talking about? What are we doing today? Awesome. Okay, so. Here is a little outline of what we're going to cover in case you were sitting here wondering already if your question was going to be covered. Um, so we're going to start by defining kin first and talking about what kin, uh, who kin are, what kinship care is, and anything else you might need to know about the child welfare space, and a little bit about a client, uh, the Washington State Department for Children, Youth, and Families. We'll get into that, who was involved. Then we spend a good amount of time talking about what we did for co-design, what, what that meant for us, um, what activities were included in that. And then we'll talk about um, what we produced, the deliverables, the outcomes, a little bit about how it's already being received, and then we'll open it up uh, into a Q&A. So let's define that kin first term. Renata, tell us, um, what does kin first mean? Yeah, thank you. Um, so kinship care really describes um, when a child cannot remain at home with their parents, um, placing them with friends, relatives, grandparents, cousins, <laughs> rather than placing them in sort of traditional foster care, which some people call stranger care. Um, we truly appreciate foster parents. They're very important. We need them. We have a shortage of them. Consider applying to be a foster parent if you're hanging out here today. Um, and what we also know is that if there is a safe kin person for a child to be placed with, that is best for them. And so um, a kinship, kin first culture really is prioritizing, finding ways to prioritize placement with kin. Um, the reason why it's so important is because there's overwhelming research that shows that there's just less trauma, better mental health, better educational outcomes, less drug and alcohol use, <laughs> like pretty much on all, all spectrums, you know, kids do better when they're with their families that they know and love. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Sorry, go ahead. I do just want to call out that, um, one of the things that makes kinship placements difficult is that when someone decides to be a foster parent, they can take months or even years like planning that they are going to make this choice to bring a, a bring a child into their home and care for them. And with relatives, it's like that day. Sometimes it's in the middle of the night, you're getting the phone call that your relative needs a place to stay. And you have not gone through like the licensing process. So you're not, um, as a licensed foster parent, you receive like a reimbursement to help you take care of that child financially. And relatives haven't gone through that process. And so they're not getting the financial resources to help care for those kids. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for highlighting both kind of like who can are and also like why it's so much harder for those who have pre-existing relationships with these children who are removed to kind of like get in 
um, get in there and, and help out. Great. So um, Renata, back to you. Anything else you think we need to know about this client, about this context, Washington's um, DCYF Department for Children, Youth and Family? Yeah, absolutely. So um, DCYF is an agency with about 5,000 employees and many divisions. Um, focused on the well-being of children, and, and that includes the child welfare portion. Um, child welfare agencies, like I said before, they're really responsible for um, it, arranging for safe care for children and youth when they're not able to safely remain home with their parents. We coordinate with a number of um, tribes, uh, agencies, um, and contract with service providers. I mean, our staff is like 5,000, but <laughs> more than that, that we're interacting with on a daily basis. And because of the nature of our work, it's really, um, you know, it's, it, it's really controversial. People get very upset when we're involved or very upset when we're not involved. And um, there's sort of always a lot of um, opinions and scrutiny and um, just sort of feelings all around with the people <laughs> involved. Yeah, that's spot on. I'm so glad you provide that context. Yeah, that this is a huge ecosystem space and that there are a lot of feelings and a lot of really high stakes. Awesome. Thanks so much, Renata. Okay, Katrina, over to you. What did we do? Who, who was involved? How did we think about talk, uh, approaching this? <clears throat> sure. So let me tell, give you a little bit of a lay of the land. So this very, on a very high level, maps our project um, and how we uh, talk to all of those different audiences that Renata just mentioned. So we wanted to kind of chunk our project into four different sprints across each of the audiences that we plan to talk to. And we started with our core, our partner, uh, our client partner with D talking with DCYF staff. And then we branched out into talking with service providers and child placing agencies, talking to that entire network of child welfare professionals um, that Renata spoke to. And then the last sprint we, we spoke to are kinship caregivers and youth who've been raised by CAN to get their experiences. And as you can, you might be able to sort of see um, as we went through, we were sort of doing this like expanding network and we were building connections along the way because we wanted to make sure that no one felt like they, we were kind of coming in from left field, that we'd made our kind of proper introductions as us being totally new to this community and knowing that you know folks can feel really put on the spot to talk about things. And, and we want to make sure that people can feel transparent and open with us. So that's why we order them in this way. And we knew that talking to kinship caregivers could be tricky. It could be hard to find them um, because not all of them um, are connected di directly to um, DC Way Up. There's a lot, actually uh, 17 out of 18 kinship caregivers are just sort of doing it informally. They're just, you know, like, okay, mom can't take care of kids. So grandma's stepping in. And so there's not a formal state connection, but we wanted to talk to those families too. Um, so that's how we structured our, our, um, our uh, sprint. And then all along the way, we were talking to tribal partners um, and we know that, you know, in Washington state there, um, there's a significant number of tribes. And so we wanted to make sure we were both talking to folks about the state angle of uh, kinship care and also the tribal angle. Um, and uh, as we did our work, then we, uh, we kind of did two things. We built in for repeat interactions um, when we talked to our participants. So our step one was to do these in-depth interviews and really understand what is the experience of, you know, caseworkers or a service provider who's a kin navigator or a child placing agency who's providing wraparound services um, or other support services and connecting kin to licensing. And as after we did the, those in-depth interviews, then we followed up with these uh, ways of reflecting back what we heard. We wanted to like make sure and validate that what we understood as newbies to this space was right and real so that, uh, so that DCYF and the community partners could move forward based on what we were hearing. So that's why you see like multiple things stacked uh, under each sprint in terms of our, our activities. And we'll explain a little bit more about that in a bit. But I think Shelly wanted to bring up something around the tribal partners specifically and why they're so important. Yeah, thanks for taking that back to me. So 
As you can see, we chunked our audiences into these four and then kind of overlaid tribal partners throughout. And that's because the tribal partners, there are 29 federally recognized tribes in the region of Washington um, and other tribal uh, individuals or American Indian and Alaska Native uh, uh, populations throughout. Um, and so we, we found quickly that we learned that there are uh, native or tribal perspectives across each of these populations, or of course, American Indian or Alaska Native staff within DCYF. There are service providers who do outreach specifically to that uh, group and child placing agencies, some of which are um, uh, operating underneath a child welfare agency within a sovereign tribe. And since um, sovereign tribes are their own governments, right? They have their own rules and their relationship to DCYF is governed by ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. There were a lot of particular dynamics there that we wanted to make sure we captured. Um, we wanted to really understand how being uh, a tribe and having your own sovereign government within the territory of Washington was gonna affect the ways in which service providers and placing agencies and of course kin caregivers themselves could experience the relationship between these two agencies that were coordinating in the care of children in their homes. Um, we also really found uh, pretty quickly, we learned that uh, the imperative to keep children and youth with their communities and families was enshrined in, in ICWA. It was kind of like the primary goal of the tribal approach. And so we were actually in this project uplifting and taking first lessons from um, a Native approach, a Native American approach. Um, and so um, those were really, really important features of what we were able to learn from tribal partners. So back to you, Katrina, to tell us um, more about what co-design looks like. Cool, thanks, Shelley. So I alluded to this a little bit in the previous slide, but we wanted to kind of spell out um, more broadly what we did to make co-design work in this particular project. And our goal was to lay the groundwork for cultural change. So it's one thing to do a research project and say like, these are the ways in which you can adjust your practices in order to like shift your numbers and get to a, a more kin first culture. But it's another thing to like actually get a whole community moving in one direction. And so we knew that this was a bit of an organized, it was like both, you know, sort of an organizing, you know, community organizing um, bent to our research. And we needed to make sure that we were bringing people along the way. Um, and we were both like meeting them where they were at currently and understanding their pain points and the difficulties, especially with um, DCYF staff who've been through a lot of changes. We heard so much about this concept of like change fatigue, where it's like we got a new policy in here and this one's changing now and I don't even understand the last one and what am I supposed to do here? And now you're coming in and doing research and telling me I'm going to change again. Like, I don't want to change again. <laughs> And so we didn't we didn't want to like conduct a closed research process where we were just gathering all the information along the way. And then after six months of work, dumping it out at the end and saying like, OK, here you go, like try to catch on to what what we think is the right way to go. We knew that was not going to work at all. So this is why co-design was so key and why doing those multiple engagements throughout our work was so key. So the way that we designed for that was the interviews. So we did in-depth interviews, as I mentioned, with each group. We talked to several subcommittees within um, uh, DCYF uh, to create transparency and make sure we were aligning with them. There are also other projects happening that were um, around kinship care, but sort of like adjacent to our work. And we wanted to make sure we were aligning our work across other projects. Um, with caregivers who we talked to at the very end of our project, we wanted to be able to reflect and amplify their voices. Um, and with time running short, then our team decided to put together uh, just a short two page, very plain language memo reflecting back like, I think this is what we heard from you. And if you have any comments or questions, like, you know where to find us at email address. <laughs> um, and we got a lot of positive responses to that. And that worked really well to validate the things that we'd heard from those caregivers. But the, the, the keystone to all of this work was really the workshops. Um, so we did workshops after three different sprints. Um, DCOIF staff were involved in all of them. And in our middle workshop, then we had all of our service professionals together. So both the government and non-government non child welfare professionals in the room together virtually. Um, and so in those workshops, then we would um, share our findings and ask for reflections or amendments to what we heard. We had them walk through a bunch of activities, which I'm going to show you in just a second. 
and helped build our uh, potential recommendations, ideas and ways to, to kind of move things forward. And then because we knew that A, not everyone can be in, in the room and we had caps on our participants and maybe the timing didn't work, then we did an async version of our workshop and we put together this survey where you basically followed along through all of the steps of the workshop just in a survey format, which actually worked pretty well. We got a bunch of responses to that and, and folks there were able to add more color too. If they didn't voice something in the workshop, they could also do the survey. Um, so it, it added another really nice way to be involved in the work. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of what those workshops looked like and, and what we did. All right, over yeah, to you, Shelly. You can really see just how, thanks, just you can really see how enthusiastically folks were participating. Um, we're showing here two stills on the left and the right from two different workshops. Um, and each color on the left hand side, each color is sort of like uh, to show you that it comes from a distinct breakout group that um, everybody all together collectively like had an update from what we had um, we had been hearing in these um, conversations and then we broke out into distinct groups in order to brainstorm solutions to overcome specific barriers and the barriers were you know what we had what we had been identifying in our data gathering and so you can see the participants really actively uh, got to produce uh, suggestions for uh, solutions and got to see a digital record being created in the, in the movie's mural that you can use any kind of whiteboarding digital space. Um, and then we were able to, you know, do affinity mapping from that. So we, we took these inputs, we allowed participants to see a reflection of their ideas being noted. We also gave them an opportunity to hear what other people thought. Um, and then we also were able to do affinity mapping with that. And I think we were really stunned by how much participation there was in this and just how enthusiastic the software. So I, I wonder, Renato, if you want to speak to that a little bit about like how you know how DCYF staff were involved in this process. Yeah, I mean, like I said before, you know, this type of work lends itself to passion, right? So people are passionate about the work and they have big ideas and, and they want to share. And in a bureaucracy as, as large as, uh, you know, DCYF is, it's hard to have a voice. Um, and so I think that um, people were really eager to participate and felt good about getting to see their thoughts um, on these stickies and grouped together and um, amplified and fed back to them. Yeah, it was really cool to see. So this screenshot here is from our first workshop that we did. And then this one at is from our second workshop where we had all of those service providers together in the room and we broke out into small groups and actually just asked them on the spot okay like let's start coming up with recommendations what do you think needs to change and so we we created this little table format which you can see on the left hand side of to break down what your recommendation is so the what the who the when what's the result or why of this of this particular action and what kind of barriers or questions so we did this in live um, format and it was really cool to see both how many recommendations people were coming up with and then the convergence or overlap between those ideas like we would have ideas in duplicate or triplicate within the same workshop or or we did this workshop on two different days and see see the ideas repeated so it was really it became really clear to us like okay this is a big thing this definitely needs to be in a part of our final report this is something that people are passionate about and multiple people are saying to highlight this kind of idea and I'll turn it over to Hannah to share this one. Thanks. Yeah. So this is my favorite uh, activity. I'm really excited to talk about. Um, this was also done in the second workshop. And as we've all been alluding to, it was really important to not just have multiple engagements where we were kind of regurgitating our data and just lecturing out to teams, but to really engage them in different ways. And one of the things we wanted to be thoughtful about was different um, learning styles, communication styles. So what Katrina just showed was um, one option for an activity in a small great breakout group of people that really were eager to kind of speak up and share in that sense. And this was another option. Um, color coded here, we had some pre very preliminary recommendations since this was about um, two thirds of the way through this project. So we caveated that a lot that the none of these recommendations were set in stone, but a lot of the data was kind of pushing us towards some of these themes. And we asked the small group uh, to help us create kind of a heat map to have a better understanding of 
where the recommendations fell on this XY axis of importance and feasibility. Ultimately, it's going to be DCYF staff, service providers, and child placing agencies who need to take the ideas that we've put together from our data and run with them. And we need to have a clear understanding of what did they feel passionate about, prioritized, and what could actually be made to happen. Uh, we really didn't want to just drop an 80-page report on the laps of leadership and leave at the end of this. So it was really important that things felt actionable. And it was really interesting to see these colors kind of come together, see how different divisions had different perspectives on what was important and what was possible um, and share kind of share that and see where people thought the barriers were. Um, and this helped us really think about how we wanted to deliver everything. And so I think this is a good segue to continue on. And um, Shelly, I'll pass it to you to help explain how we took six months worth of data and you know hundreds of interactions with participants and how we put it all together into a way that felt uh, that felt digestible. Yeah, it's a great question. It was quite a task um, and uh, we had a work cut out for us, but it, it was also very exciting. So what we did ultimately is we delivered a report that had a narrative of everything that we felt we had gotten from the data gathering and also in reflections um, in other contexts. And, and we wanted the, wanted the report to be really like to stick in people's minds really effectively. And so we ended up using metaphors for imagery that could give a kind of impression of what the overall like theme or sentiment of the findings were without having people get lost in the details of like, well, which division does that specifically re refer to? And it's not my practice in my office to do precisely that. And so we just wanted people to have a kind of an overall easily, easy, easily um, retrievable uh, impression of what the findings were. And um, so we, we use these metaphors to describe what we, what we heard, um, the experience for kinship caregivers was. And that was another thing that was really important to us. We wanted the findings to be organized, not by division or by function um, from the department side, but from the experience of the users so that we could really be bringing their experiences and their voices in and reflecting it back uh, to the department. So we, we told sort of like three distinct but related stories. And these metaphors are kind of um, uh, on a journey uh, theme. <laughs> um, so we we found that the kinship caregivers are, are standing on uneven ground. Some are um, at a greater disadvantage than others because of historical disproportionality and marginalization. And so um, we found that as a result of that, some kinship caregivers need more support to achieve equity. Um, we also had that kinship caregivers kind of feel this, this uh, experience, uh, they experience it as an uphill climb, they, experience, they feel friction when interacting with DCYF, um, as if the systems are kind of working against them. Um, and finally, like a lot of them tell us they feel like they are dropped into a maze without a map or a guide, they feel abandoned in really complex processes that are changing really dramatically and have really high stakes um, can, you know, how they navigate these systems has really uh, life altering impacts on who's in their household and when and how. Um, so those, those were the, the sort of key head, headliners. And I just have to say how impactful um, staff and myself personally um, found these metaphors. Um, it was so easy to relate to. It was memorable. Um, like even when I talked at the beginning of the conference or this presentation about um, how kinship caregivers are on, you know, come from a different place than our general foster parents. I mean, these things have, you know, stuck with me and, um, and they also used like animation when they were doing some of their presentations. Um, there were the workshops, like there were such um, just like visually um, helpful and um, just engaging. There was such engagement in this work that I found so impactful. And I think others um, who were involved did too. I'm so glad to hear that. And that's really, that means a lot to us, definitely. So if that was sort of like how we organized the like bulk of the report and it was like a you know some, some 70 some pages of document we also it was really important to us that that the recommendations not get lost in a really lengthy narrative that maybe not everybody was in a place to or had the time to read and so we we pulled the recommendations out and sort of uh, uh, 
got them into a playbook format. Um, and so that was really important to us so that this could stand on its own. It could, it could almost be a tearaway, like it'd be a standalone document. Um, and it was uh, structured in a way that would lend itself really, really well to uh, a numbered list that could just be converted into an Excel spreadsheet and the agency could kind of go down the line um, and say, okay, we're going to implement this first, this next, this in three to six months, et cetera. Um, and so you're seeing here a snapshot of, you know, one of the sections of the playbook, which was theme themed. Um, so, you know, this theme six was all around updating kin specific supports and services. And it was item one, item two, and so on. And we use these emojis also to say, which are high importance, which are really being sort of like repeated to us, deeply felt, um, and so on. And so, um, yeah, Renata, how, how do you think this landed for you as a team and, and for DCYF? Well, I just think it's awesome. It's so clearly outlined um, and really like sort of crystallizes <laughs> depths. Um, we have already um, started rolling out some of the recommendations. Um, and I, it makes sense because I think in some of the workshops, you know, we were talking, we were processing through six months. And so some of the things have already started happening. So um, one of the things um, which, started a while ago because it had to go through legislature, uh, but starting July 1st, um, DCYF is going to start issue an, issuing initial licenses for kinship caregivers, um, basically allowing them to receive the same financial support as licensed foster parents for 90 days while they go through the licensing process. So that is a huge win. We're really excited about that. And then um, additionally, we're in the process of developing an easily accessible handbook that details the supports available to kinship caregivers. Um, another one of the plays that is selected in the in the playbook. Yeah, I'm so, so excited about that. And I'm seeing also the, the chat is really like exploding with emojis and excitement. And it's just so true. This is gonna make an enormous difference in the lives of caregivers who are historically marginalized more likely to be in poverty, and they can be receiving funding from day one while they're taking care of children in state dependency. And it's just enormous. So that makes a huge difference. Great. So um, very soon, I think we're going to open it up for questions and Cheryl's going to be feeding them. But maybe our first question can be um, to Renata again, what was surprising about this work for you? What did you feel like you learned? And then we can go from there. So I think what I found most surprising is how little I was surprised. <laughs> like everyone sort of was saying the same things. I, we we heard the same things from our staff, from the caregivers, from our contract providers, from the tribes. You know, everybody saw the same issues. Um, so I guess what was also surprising to me is that if everybody knows what the issues are, like, why can't we fix them? <laughs> like, everyone has the same problems here and sees it. Um, but what I learned is that um, knowing what the issues are is not the same thing as being able to fix it. And so being able to lay out the information in a report really crystallized the issues in a way that we could, like, easily share it with leadership and, like, justify funding. Um and justify the changes that people have been talking about. Um, the playbook really gave us some step-by-step -step guidance on how to start like fixing these problems. And the plays, are, like some are very small, like um, like the one I referenced before, where we're gonna create a easily accessible you know, publication. And then it goes all the way to some giant ones that DCYF is not going to be able to enact. But hopefully um, with partnerships with other governmental agencies, with other um, community agencies, looking at this and seeing where can they fit in and help make Washington state a kin first culture um, state. Uh, so I'm just really excited about it. I did see some questions in the chat about um, wanting to see the report and it will be on our website soon um, on the dcyf website under the thriving families page um, but it's not there yet <laughs> cool all right we're ready to open it up for questions cheryl i believe you are the the moderator 
our discussion here. I'll pass it over to you. Yes, thank you. I've collected a few questions from the chat. I'm going to take them out of order uh, as I feel like. Uh, but please feel free to dump more questions in there. And thank you, Renata, for having jumped in and uh, proactively answered several of the folks' questions. Um, so we'll start with, uh, you talked about uh, copies of final reports and deliverables being available on the website uh, in future, so that will be great. I thought this was a really good question, especially when you're starting a project and you're doing this exploratory type of work. Um, you might not know how it's going to unfold. And so Anna was asking, what is a good way to present the project's roadmap or something similar to the client so that they have an idea or have some confidence in where you're going? I can take this one. <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, I'm Hannah Harrington. I was the product and delivery manager on this. And so um, I, I worked a lot with Renata and the team at the very start to make sure we were aligned on our understanding of how to do this. And I think most importantly, it's aligning on goals I think if I've learned anything over the years, it's that no plan, no timeline you create at the beginning of a project looks the same at the end of the project. And I think it's really important that everyone involved, especially the client, knows that those pivots and changes are totally expected and it's not a reflection of things going wrong. So uh, we did a couple of things uh, working with Renata and her team, we made sure we had clarity on the goal and the audiences that we involved and that really helped set kind of the guardrails and we developed the approaches along the way. For example, workshops were not part of the original scope of this work. That's something that came up as we were talking with Renata and the team um, about how to make sure we were going to create something at the end that would be welcomed and well-received and actionable. And a lot of what we kept hearing was this hunger and this desire to be involved and to not just have something thrown on their laps where they have no idea where it came from. And so we developed the idea for workshops a couple weeks in. Um, and so it was important that we had weekly touch points with the DCYF team. And we did weekly communications that rolled up what we accomplished and what we were planning for the short term next week. Um, and I think that helped us remain really nimble along the way. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, I've got another question about your process. Uh, so Ilza would like to know if you could share some more ideas on how UX researchers can effectively share findings during presentations with clients, uh, especially during immediate internal feedback meetings. Ooh, this is a good one. So this is something we didn't uh, put up on our deck, but uh, we did checkpoints or finding share outs after each sprint. So we talked to our DCYF staff, and then we put together a deck that highlighted what we had identified were the roadblocks and um, included some ideas for like, not, not even like recommendations, but like baby ideas of like, these are ways in which DCYF staff thought we could start to shift things forward. So like signaling like that, that this might become a recommendation eventually. And in packaging our findings, we try to keep things really tight and help people follow the theme of what was going on. Um, and I mean, we supported it with the details too, but as Shelly was saying, like we ended up using these metaphors at the end of the day to make sure that we were, we were making sure we had something that was really sticky, um, for folks to walk away with. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, we, you know, putting together those high level themes, keeping them short and tight, backing our findings with quotes, uh, to make sure that you could hear the voices of people um, you know, saying why this is such a big need or such a big problem, um, and then presenting those like baby beginner ideas of our recommendations. Fantastic. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, we've got a different take on a question from Liz. She's interested to know, was working with the tribes a requirement or was it something that your team decided to bring into scope? Uh, she notes that it is pretty common for vulnerable groups to be scoped out of a project out of fear of adding complexity, out of a thought that they are edge cases. So she's curious if you ran into something like that and how you addressed it. This is the million dollar question. <laughs> how do we use co-design for justice? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, this was not something that we experienced pushback with this client. I will, I will say DCYF was extremely proactive about owning um, the need to engage with marginalized, minoritized groups and vulnerable populations. Um, not 
not only I imagine because of the history of child welfare and, and the way in which it's been a part of systematic campaigns to separate families among Indigenous and people of color. Um, but this is something that the agency is leading on and wants to adjust for and wants to change. And so this wasn't um, a case where we had pushed back from the client on it. I think it's also something we would have pushed back on if we needed to, <laughs> because like you say, um, uh, anybody who thinks that these are like edge cases is kind of misunderstanding, I think, like who benefits from, who is involved with these kinds of agencies and the need to center those experiences in order to adjust for pain points and like specific to those experiences. Um, you know, for example, like background checks are a really critical part of what has to happen for a family to be approved um, to be a caregiver. Uh, but background checks are also places where histories of over-policing show up in documented barriers to um, approval for certain populations. And so if we if we were to try to identify ways of overcoming that pain point without speaking to specifically people in those um, populations, we would we would kind of be defeating the purpose of trying to, to make the system better to try to overcome those barriers. So um, yeah. I'll leave it there. And I don't know if Katrina wants to add anything else. Yeah, I'll add one more, a couple more things. I forgot to include this when I was talking about like what we did, but we did most of our work remotely, like with all the child welfare professionals. But then when we got to the sprint about kin caregivers, then we were really intentional about going out there to meet them in person. We knew that because of all kinds of barriers and for our own research edification, it was going to be really critical for us to go out and see, meet these folks. Um, and so we were able to do that um, and through that meet folks in lots of different kinds of places and get a better understanding of the communities in which they live um, and visited folks who uh, are, you know, recent immigrants to the U.S. or non-English speaking. Uh, we, you know, visit, we uh, uh, interviewed a participant who was currently living in a shelter and actually did a text-based interview for that because they were unable to join Zoom. Imagine that, you know, we wanted to make sure we we reached them in their own capacity. So we did lots of things and DCYF was fully on board uh, with, with all of it uh, to make sure that we were reaching all of the different kinds of populations because it doesn't matter what community you're in, everyone, <laughs> you know, folks in their communities that they need to support families and, you know, want to be caregivers. So we deliberately included those folks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all of that. I think we've got uh, time for one more that's a nice meaty question that has to do with the different backgrounds and perspectives that you all brought to this work. So I'm going to munge together two questions, one from Hillary and one from Danielle. Uh, noticing that at least two of the Bloomworks team come from a public health background. Uh, Renata, of course, we're assuming that you don't explicitly have a design background. And there's a question as to, did anyone have any previous experience with foster care or working in children's services other than Renata, of course? Uh, so how do you feel like your various backgrounds informed your work on this project? And how did you learn from each other about the different disciplines that you brought to this work? Well, I'll start. I um, so I didn't have any co-design official training, but I have always said, um, like, why are all the decisions being made by the people not doing the work? And it's always been a frustration of mine in um, you know working in a bureaucracy that these you know decisions were being rolled out to the employees who you know couldn't who had to enact it and, and it wasn't working. So um, I've just always, you know, known that this was the right way to do it. So I was really excited to, um, you know, to be able to be involved in this project. I'll jump in just to say that one, I love this question. <laughs> um, I think what was interesting about our team is that a lot of us, um, have really circuitous roots to where we are right now um, working with Bloom. And I'll also note, we, we took this slide out for time, but we actually have a, a larger team. Um, so Shelly, Katrina and I, uh, and another researcher have been on it since October. And then we added two additional researchers and two subject matter experts. So we grew to be a large team throughout the process. 
Um, and I'll say that we really leaned on each other to learn along the way. Um, Katrina and I come from public health, and I think a lot of that um, around plain language, adult learning theory, a lot of that came into play here. Um, Shelly has a lot of the ethnographic uh, background, and she can speak to that. We also made sure, um, you know, part of co-design in general is making sure we're incorporating people with lived experience. Um, so we, we had those perspectives on the team. Uh, we had someone on our team that uh, was a fluent Spanish speaker, and so it helped us support interviews with monolingual Spanish speakers. And we also made connections with folks in uh, service provider positions who could help provide uh, translation and interpretation services for us. So I think a lot of the backgrounds, and in tagging onto some of the panel discussions from the previous one, I think user design uh, and user research is just so interesting because there's so many things that it touches that you don't need this really strict traditional background to come in and do it. It's coming in with kind of this open mind of how to get everyone in the same room and aligned in the direction that we want to go. So, Shelly, Katrina, I don't know if you want to add to that in terms of your backgrounds. I think that's spot on. We're almost at time, but um, I'll just say that, yeah, I'm a trained sociologist. I have worked in the social workspace, not in child welfare, but in the basic income guarantee. So have an attention to ways in which uh, income and material support is really critical to transforming social outcomes. Um, and also drew a lot on my experience as an activist and a community organizer. And I think all of those things are ingredients that are important for co-design. Yeah, so I'll round it out and just say that like we all had varying amounts of experience in this space starting off and we pulled in subject matter experts to specifically deepen our knowledge, both in the child welfare space and with um, tribal nations in Washington specifically. Um, but we also just did a ton of reading in the beginning to be like, okay, like, what is this space? What do we need to understand? We created a bunch of murals for ourselves in the background, like mapping you know processes or mapping stakeholders and just trying to reflect whatever we were learning in our own heads uh which some of that made it over to dcyf <laughs> uh, at the end of the day <laughs>